This is my fourth year at Boston College, but I've been teaching since 1987. American history, 19th century primarily, uh, politics and economics, but pretty much anything that they want to throw at me. Comic books. I taught a course in uh, the history of comic books in the 1970s, and my students put on a comic book exhibition that did a beautiful job. Well, I'm a scholar of the Republican Party. I study primarily 19th century politics and economics, and if you do that, you must understand the Republican Party. But then I also teach in both halves of American history, so moving into the 20th century with the Republican Party seemed a no-brainer. I'm going to have to go with 1987. Uh, I wrote four books first um, to really get the, the 19th century under wraps, and I taught again for a couple of decades, but it's been in the back of my mind for a long time. It'd be yeah, interesting right. to move on after this one. It's intended for a popular audience. It's not, it, it is theoretically informed. It's actually deeply theoretically informed, but you would not know that reading it. It's a bunch of great stories that tell the, the largest issues of the American past in a way that I hope is fun and digestible. Uh, I'm a historian, is how I would describe my own politics. Um, people who read my work on the, from the left uh, insist that I'm a far righty, and people who read my work from the right insist I'm a far lefty. I'm a historian. I look at what happened, and I say what happened. I don't know. We don't really talk about it. I think we divide politically according to issue. Uh, we argue issues a lot, but I don't know how people vote now. You know, I'm not, that's a good question, too. I'm not entirely sure I could make a statement on that because, of course, um, if you look at the students who come to you, w once people knew I worked on the Republican Party, I get enormous numbers of Republican students who are avowedly Republican and come in and say, I'm a Republican like you, to which I answer, I'm a, a professor who studies history. Um, so I don't think I have a very good sense of what the young people are doing right now because they're self-selecting to work with me because they think I'm on the right. Actually, it's interesting. That final chapter um, was very, very difficult to write. In fact, I found myself, um, my footnotes for that chapter in the original draft, and this is not, of course, the original draft, started to run uh, well over five to 600 footnotes in that one chapter, which I think in the final draft runs to about 30 pages. I don't really know. And at one point, as I am amassing more and more and more and more evidence, because I wanted to make sure everything was grounded, I, I literally was sitting at my desk and I said, I've got to stop. If I were studying the 1920s or the 19-teens or the 1880s, I would have stopped amassing evidence a good 400 sources ago. It's time to quit. This is what I think happened as a historian. Um, I think it's right. I suspect you're going to disagree, but it is well sourced. It's not a diatribe. It was never intended to be a diatribe, and much of this book came out in very different ways than I expected it to. Um, my, some of my favorite presidents ended up not being my favorite presidents anymore, and some people I really didn't like at all I ended up coming out very favorably toward. Uh, I think what most surprised me was the Panic of 1893 and how that happened. That's a completely new interpretation of the Panic of 1893. Um, I think what also surprised me was, and this may shock people, but how relatively unimportant Watergate turned out to be. Watergate for me was what got me into political and economic history. It was huge in my life. When I did the book proposal, I expected that I would have an entire chapter on Watergate. The original draft was going to hinge on Watergate. And when you look at the sweep of American history, Watergate, of course, is very important, but it is not anywhere near as important in the scheme of American history as I thought it was. Well, the biggie in the 20th century, of course, is the National Review. Um, personally, I read uh, fairly widely across the spectrum. There's a large thesis in this book, and that is that the central theme, one of the central themes in American history, is the conflict between the Declaration of Independence and the Constitution. The Declaration of Independence sets forward the concept that America is a land of equal opportunity. Not of equal outcome, but of equal opportunity. Uh, it was a great principle. It was a principle on which men rallied to fight the American Revolution. But it was not the founding law of the country. The founding law of the country was the Constitution. And by the time the founding fathers were writing the Constitution, they were concerned with something very different than they were when, they, when Jefferson wrote the Declaration of Independence. They were concerned then about the protection of property. That became another founding principle of America, the protection of property. The conflict between equality of opportunity and the protection of property has never been fully resolved in American society.
The Republican Party, I argue, was the political arm that set out to re resolve that profound conflict. So there is a thesis about the Republican Party, but the larger question is a question for Americans whether or not they care about the Republican Party or the Democratic Party or any party at all. And that is how do you resolve the conflict between equal opportunity and the protection of property, both of which are legitimate and very important founding principles for this nation. Uh, I'm fascinated by the Democratic Party. Uh, so the issue here is that I'm I like the 19th century, right. and the Democrats in the 19th century are not really very interesting. Some of them are, and I can certainly talk about the Democrats, but the, the Democrats are much more interesting in the 20th century, which to my mind is not as interesting as the 19th. Well, first of all, because it's property that's established in the Constitution versus equality of opportunity that's established in the Declaration of Independence. Um, to put this in an American context, um, so, so Locke plays in funny ways in America, who, and he's not actually, of course, an American founding father, just to be clear. But that being said, in the American context, it plays out in a really cool way. And that is that one of the factors in play here, in addition to the conflict between equality of opportunity and protection of property, is expansion and the expansion into the American West. So you can come up with new ways to construct a society that has a limited space, and you can argue about those ways, and, and nothing will have changed as long as you're not expanding. Once you add expansion into that, you come up with new kinds of conflicts. So of course, as soon as the American Revolution is underway, and there is a, a law that the Americans cannot cross the Appalachians, Daniel Boone does it. And he goes across the Appalachians from Virginia into Kentucky, opens up Kentucky, and has this new concept of what an American West is going to be. Once he's there in Kentucky, and, and for various reasons that filters back um, to, the East uh, to the East Coast of Virginia and infects people like Abraham Lincoln's grandfather, once people in Virginia start to pour into Kentucky, what happens is a, is a conflict, a very explicit, obvious conflict in it's not a state then, actually, it's a region of Virginia, in Kentucky be between the idea that poor men, like Daniel Boone, can go out there and make a fortune versus the, the slave owners, the planters who come in and take over the legislature and take over the laws. So what the founding fathers see, because this is all going to take place in the 1790s, what they see is this conflict. Can men actually rise in this new land, or is that new land going to be taken over by wealthy, in this case, slave owners, who then change the laws, to manipulate the laws so that they are able to amass land and property in their own hands. What I'm looking for here is the, um, the ideological conflict, if you will, between these two quite legitimate, quite important, and quite fundamental principles. So what happens? The, you got the, the Congress is meeting under the Articles of Confederation, and um, it, as you know, they don't do a lot. But one of the things they do do that is very important is the Northwest Ordinance. Everybody pays all kinds of attention to the lack of slave, the fact that the Northwest Ordinance um, makes sure there will be no slavery in what become the Midwestern states. But the very first thing the Northwest Ordinance does is it outlaws primogeniture. One of the things it's trying to do is to make sure that that power does not get amassed in any small group because w not not because they're objecting to the idea of people having stuff but because of what that does to the concept of democracy if a few people get too much and of course in this era the numbers we're talking about to us look ridiculously small but they looked very big in those days if a few people get too much they will buy the press and they will buy their own representation in the legislatures or the Congresses. Once they do that, the laws will change so that individuals will no longer have a say in their government and they will not be able to have equal access to resources to be able to rise on their own. And the whole concept of government, which is what they're talking about in this period, they're not talking about individual well-being or what's socially good or any of that. They're talking about the concept of creating a new kind of government that whole concept will collapse. And that's a concept that the Founding Fathers are struggling with. It's, it's actually, a, a, the Northwest Ordinance is based on an earlier law by Thomas Jefferson that they're struggling with in that foundational period. The Kansas-Nebraska Act is my favorite event in American history. It is the, the first event I ever memorized. 
It's one of the few dates I can always come up with. Um, the Kansas-Nebraska Act is central. And the reason for that is the Kansas-Nebraska Act is 1854. Um, it passes in the spring of 1854. And it's enormously important because it is the act that passes Congress that convinces northern men, northern men on the make, that there is this slave power that you mentioned, that the country really is in danger of falling under the power of uh, a very small class of slave owners who are going to monopolize the executive, uh, the legislative branch, and the courts. And with the passage of the Kansas-Nebraska Act, um, which negates the Missouri Compromise that had previously guaranteed that the Northwest, um, a huge, huge piece of land, would stay free and be accessible to, to poorer men, that that is now going to be open to slavery. And Lincoln says it's only a hop, skip, and a jump until slavery is national. So after the passage of the Kansas-Nebraska Act through um, the House of Representatives in, in May of 1854, you know, people always point to rip on Wisconsin, but there's this really cool meeting that takes place in Washington in the, the rooms of uh, Edward Dickinson from Massachusetts and another, another um, member of the House of Representatives. And he's a fun character because his daughter is Emily Dickinson, mm -hmm. who's not yet a recluse. She actually fall, uh, visits her father sometimes in Washington. They meet in their rooms in a select boarding house, and they actually pick that room because that the, that boarding house has the best food in Washington. And 30 guys come together, uh, s centralized actually around a group of three brothers who were in Congress at the time, although they represent different states. And they come to that meeting from a number of different parties, but they leave that day saying, we've got to start a new party that will stand against the slave power, and they begin to call themselves Republicans. Now, there's meetings all over the country against the Kansas-Nebraska Act, and they, they feed gradually into what becomes the Republican Party in 1855 and 1856. But that meeting in Dickinson's rooms at Mrs. Crutchett's boarding house, uh, those 30 men, is really the germ of the Republican Party. It's a wonderful I image. Imagine what? those guys. I most admire about Abraham Lincoln, I think, his brain. I think he is one of the brightest Americans we've ever produced. Eisenhower, by the way, I think is another one who has never gotten his due. Um, and his ability to figure his way through a problem without taking things personally. And he's an exceedingly bright man up against an impossible situation who manages to, to walk a knife edge for a very long time. Logic matters. We don't teach logic anymore, and we should, because logic really matters, and he was a very good practitioner of it. James Henry Hammond is a fascinating figure. He really is. Um, he, you, you did know him. You just probably didn't know his name. He gave the speech that I talk so much about and call the Mudsill speech. It was actually the Cotton is King speech, which everybody knows when he goes on to say Cotton is King, and we will win if we ever have a war because everybody's got to have cotton. So everyone knows it is the Cotton is King speech. But Hammond is almost a cartoon character in any number of ways. He was um, sexually abusive not only to his slaves, but also to his nieces, who were extraordinarily well-connected. That was part of the uh, Wade Hampton family. Um, and that's itself a fascinating story. But he had a very different view of America than men like Abraham Lincoln. He believed that the way a healthy society worked and mind you, he was living in one of the wealthiest societies in the world at the time. Southern slave owners were enormously wealthy. They were well-educated. They owned beautiful paintings that they had on their walls. And I mean Rembrandts. I, I don't mean, you know, the ones their daughters did. They had reason to believe they had finally gotten it right. And they're not making excuses to say that this is why they got it right. You know, they're not making stuff up. They're really wealthy. They're really well-educated. They think they have really good ideas. They live in extraordinarily beautiful homes for the time. And he believed that they had truly come up with the way society should work. And the way society should work, according to men like James Henry Hammond, and he was only one, but the speech is just too good not to use because Lincoln explicitly responds to it in a very famous speech. Um, what he argued in, in, in a speech before Congress in 1858 was that um, Society was healthiest when a few very well-educated, very wealthy men ran things, because they were the only ones who had the education and the brains to direct society as it should be done. 
And the proof of that was the fact they were so wealthy. God had honored them with extraordinary wealth. They'd figured out a good society. And the way a good society worked was for them to direct the labor of lesser beings. Now, those lesser beings in the South were men of color, men and women of color. But to those people, James Henry Hammond believed they should not have uh, education because that would only make them um, grumbly and want more than they could, could get. They should not certainly have any voice in American society. They shouldn't get much in the way of clothing or food because that would simply be wasted on them. That money should travel upward so that it would create this extraordinarily intelligent, powerful class. And that was the way a healthy society would work. And he said, and to see that I'm right, and he says this in the speech, look around you. We're the, the richest, most educated people in the world. This must be the best way to do things. He, argue, he, he says, uh, uh, James Henry Hammond calls the majority of people mud sills. Mud sills are the pieces of wood that are slammed into the ground on which a house rests in the 19th century. So they are the foundation of society, but they literally live in the mud. Lincoln says this is not how a healthy society works. A healthy society works the exact opposite way. That is, it's the workers who create value, um, not the, the people at the top of the heap. It's the people at the bottom of the heap who create value, and a healthy society works in such a way that those people have access to education and to resources so that they can produce and rise. And the more that they produce, the more capital they will create, the more they will employ other people. And the way to make a society move in advance is to put government on the side of equality of opportunity for the average worker. Isn't that great? I couldn't believe that when I found that. The conscience of a conservative, 1960, under Barry Goldwater's name, but it was written by Albert and Bazell. Uh, if you actually line that up directly with the, the, the James Henry Hammond speech, the points are almost point by point the same. The, the idea that government should work in such a way that you protect property because you create, I mean, he does talk about society being directed by an elite uh, rather than, the, than a democracy. He says the Founding Fathers did not set up a democracy because they were afraid of the redistribution of wealth, which is all over James Henry Hammond. Um, the, the, certainly, uh, certainly, Albert and Bazell was not advocating slavery, and, and I want to make that very clear. That concept, that idea that a small, educated, wealthy class should direct society is the same in these different periods. Now, now before you get angry about that, that's not an illegitimate argument. It's not one I happen to adhere to, but it's not an argument that you can inherently say somebody is attacking you if you hold that. An awful lot of societies have worked very successfully that way. That's not actually where the Republican Party started, but it's not an attack to say somebody believes that. Let me be clear, you're the one who keeps talking about how I'm saying that they want slavery. But that concept <laughs> of how society should be ordered is the same under James Henry Hammond as it is under conscience of a conservative. Now, you can disagree with that, and you can come back and say that's not the way he wanted society ordered. But you can't say that they're not the same if you've read both the documents. They just are. It's been told by a few academics, but it is a fascinating story. Uh, not least because of the material that could not make it into this shorter book, and that is that the reason that Americans heard so much about the Paris Commune was because there was only one foreign observer left in the city during the Paris Commune, and it was a man who was in line to be the next Republican nominee. He didn't end up getting the nomination, but they let him stay, and he actually sent out dispatches by balloon. Great story. Um, the Paris Commune happens in, obviously, Paris after the uh, Franco-Prussian War in, from March through May of 1871. And it's very important in America because Americans have just laid down the first successful transatlantic cable, which is quite expensive. They've been getting news dispatches across that cable from the Franco-Prussian War um, for, for while it was going on, and people re read the newspapers to read what was happening in the war. But when the war ended, there wasn't much going on. In order to keep those cables hopping and in order to promote the candidacy of um, the, the observer in Paris, a man named Elihu Washburn, the Republican newspapers trumpeted the Paris Commune and everything that was happening in the Paris Commune. Now, I'm not a scholar of France. I have no idea what was actually happening in Paris.
But what shows up in the American newspapers is that workers have taken over the city. They burn the Tuileries, they kill a bunch of priests, uh, and most shocking to Americans, women fill bottles with this newfangled stuff called petroleum, light it on fire, toss it in the buildings, and are blowing up buildings. The way that plays back in America combines with Reconstruction because people in the South, Democrats in the South who are not getting any traction in the North and Northern politics keep saying that in America after 1870, when African Americans are going to be voting, they're going to vote to redistribute wealth. They're going to destroy society and they're going to try and take everything for themselves. They are workers who are turning the world upside down. Well, Northerners are like, yeah, whatever, you're Southern Democrats, you just fought a war, we don't like you. Then they look at what's happening in Paris. And in Paris, it looks like this is exactly what Southern Democrats are saying is happening in the South. And this starts to get traction for the whole concept of having workers participating in government as being a very dangerous thing. Mm -hmm. Um, and it's, it's, you know, phenomenal stories, lithographs. It's a, it's a really major event in American history. The linchpin of 19th century politics is New York. It has way more electoral votes than anybody else in the country. And the linchpin of New York is, of course, New, New, of course, New York City. Upstate New York is Republican. New York City is Democratic. In order to hold New York State, you've got to hold New York City. And New York City is held by the Democratic machine that's powered by immigrants. So Republicans in New York City grab hold of this idea to say, look, you got to stop the Democratic immigrants from voting, because if you do, they're going to take over the government and they're going to redistribute wealth. So from within the Republican Party, this theme gets picked up. It gets blown up nationally for other reasons in 1872, the re-election of Grant. And uh, from then, it becomes a trope in American society from then on. Now, see, that's another interesting part of the, about the book I did not expect. The domestic poly policy comes out of the imperialism rather than the other way around, which I would not have thought. Um, Teddy Roosevelt, um, interesting character, um, and, and one of those that I did not like as much when I finished the Is book right? as I did when I started, yes. He doesn't, he doesn't do very much. He talks a lot. Um, it's that old joke about they ran out of the letter I whenever they tried to print his speeches. <laughs> right. um, but he doesn't accomplish as much as everybody thinks he does for, for because of the Congress he's up with up against. But his uh, Teddy Roosevelt is reveres Lincoln, reveres Lincoln, and is very concerned about the drift of the party in the late nineteenth century. One of the things that the party does is it argues that it is um, in the eighteen eighties, eighteen nineties, is that it is the party that advances morality and individual responsibility and um, individual uplift, if you will. And for various reasons, largely because he supports the Navy so much and is very close friends with Henry Cabot Lodge, who also supports the Navy, both and also with um, Alfred Mahan, who writes a very important book about the Navy, uh, they begin to say that you need to be able to take this morality overseas. With the arrival of the um, the concentration policy in Cuba by the Spanish, people like Teddy Roosevelt say, we've got to spread morality to places like Cuba. And if you do that at the international level, you have to bring that home. You have to have an example at home that proves to the world that America's as good as we say it is. And if that's the case, we better clean up the tenements, we better get kids into schools, we better get literally the dead horses off the streets because, of course, in the late 19th century, we don't have sanitation systems, we don't have water systems, we don't have any of those things. Those have to be fixed at home in order to be a beacon to the rest of the world. So it's kind of reversed from the way you would think it is. Another man that, that is much more colorful in on paper than I suspect he was <laughs> in real life, um, humorless man, at least I found him so. He's an, a, a little bit different. La Follette, Beveridge, Cabot, Lodge, Roosevelt, all have their political epiphanies in 1884, the election of 1884, when um, the Republican candidate is corrupt enough and so in the pocket of big business that um, he loses to Cleveland, and a Democrat after the Civil War. And they end up deciding to stick with the party, but to clean up the party. And they stick with the party for the next decade, but by the time they come of age in the 1890s, they, they want to reform the Republican Party in such a way that it is accessible again to men on the make, as opposed to the, the industrialists, the people dubbed robber barons at that point, who at that point are controlling 
the Senate and therefore are controlling legislation. La Follette's very interesting. He's different than the others because La Follette actually comes out of Wisconsin. And Wisconsin is the, the, the heart of the Granger movement. And the Granger movement, and he's actually very influenced by the Granger movement. This is a movement where the state legislatures try to rein in the power of um, grain elevators, for example, rein in the power of monopolies in the Midwest. And, um, and he's strongly influenced by the idea that you should be able to use the apparatus of both state and national governments to rein in especially monopolies, but to make sure that legislation is not skewed too much toward business. That's not the same background, of course, that Teddy Roosevelt and Albert Beveridge mm -hmm. and um, Cabot Lodge, well, not Beveridge, but, but the other two, come from. So he brings that into the party, so he's different. Do they rework the party? Absolutely. This is where you get the return back to Lincoln's language of man on the make, of an even-handed government that works for everybody, um, and they do it very explicitly. I and mean, Teddy Roosevelt deliberately echoes Lincoln and says he is echoing Lincoln and stands up for Lincoln and says he is Lincoln's spokesman. It doesn't get more Lincolnian than that during his presidency. Uh, uh, you're asking about my entire graduate career. What did I draw on? Um, uh, I'm a little gobsmacked simply because um, who don't, I mean, you know, who, who don't, I mean, the footnotes only have, for the most right. part, primary sources because of the sheer length of them. Right. Um, obviously, I think Keynes was on to something. I think if you look at the numbers, it is my contention that if you look at the numbers, America is healthiest when wealth is widespread. When I was just starting in this business and was very into ideology, which is the other thing that I care very much about is language and the way it's used, which I think is an enormously powerful thing that William F. Buckley was in, onto um, and that we don't pay enough attention to. That's what I really started studying. And I had an older friend who'd lived through the Depression, and no matter what I said, she would say, who got the money? Who got the money, Heather? Follow the money. And if you follow the money, uh, what you'd find is that when the wealth is widely distributed, the country seems to do better. Reforms seem to happen. And when it starts to concentrate, there's a crash. And that's, at a very simple level, discernible through the actual historical events of the time. Now, economists, if you read them, and historical economists, which are far more important to my business, um, have all kinds of charts and have all kinds of ways of looking at the different periods, especially the late 19th century. And there's a great study, series of studies out of Stanford starting in 1900 um, that try to break down exactly different waves and who has what and how that happens. Um, fine, very important in a small term, but if you're trying to look at the larger question of the nature of America and American political parties, it seems to make more sense to go big. Well, Eisenhower got involved in politics because he was determined to stop uh, Senator Taft. But, again, more importantly to me, and, and that's worth pursuing, and we can talk about sure. that, he gets involved in politics because he is so horrified by fascism, and he's so horrified viscerally by his visit to a concentration camp. And this is kind of, in, in European history, I understand this is kind of a, a platitude, that Eisenhower you know, saw a concentration camp and didn't like it. If you read his writings, he's a very extraordinarily intelligent man, very measured writing. The letter he writes after seeing Ordruff is shattered. He's shattered. And he comes to believe over time it doesn't happen immediately, but this is no secret if you've read his diaries or his letters um, or his books as well. Um, he comes to believe that the world is on the brink of annihilation because we now have nuclear weapons when he's writing. And that the only thing standing between today, the 1950s or the 1940s, and nuclear annihilation is the even distribution of wealth. The, the, I'm sorry, I put that badly. Not the even distribution of wealth. The ability of people to rise. Because if you had extremes of inequality of wealth, they created a world in which it would be all too easy for political or religious extremists to gather followers, to gather dispossessed followers, either culturally or economically dispossessed. He was also concerned about the loss of culture, culturally or, culturally or economically dispossessed. So he was an extraordinarily interventionist man because he wanted the world 
everywhere, individuals in the world everywhere, to feel that they were not dispossessed. Not because, I mean, maybe he, because he had a moral imperative to do it, but because if they did feel like they were in trouble, either culturally or economically, they were prime fodder for a dictator, either fascist or communist or religious, he wasn't particular, he didn't like any of them, to get a huge numbers, numbers of followers, and once they had nuclear weapons, they could literally destroy the world. And this is an, really a profound argument that I don't think people have given him enough credit for. He wasn't just out there screwing around with Iran or you know, making a mess of Vietnam or any of the things that people complain about. He really did think that America had a crucial role to play in saving the world. And it was a well thought out and very intelligent argument. Uh, let me just say in terms of the ferment of the 1950s, one of the pieces that people don't make enough of a connection between is that the 1950s look extraordinarily like the 1870s. In both cases, we're coming out of a, a traumatic war that has enlisted the support of minorities and women who don't have rights in the new nation. And in both cases, you get women's rights, you get African American rights, you get Native American rights. In both cases, you get a redefinition of American citizenship, which I think is crucial. And the 50s are not just about you know those candy-colored cars. They're actually about deciding who should be a member of the nation. Now, Buckley, of course, was young when he wrote uh, God Man at Yale. He was very young. He was just out of Yale. It's not a great book. It's not well written. It's not well argued. Um, of course, he learns as he goes on. And, and the same with the early issues of the National Review. They're a mess. They're badly edited. They're badly written. Um, they're not well argued. They're not logical. Now, he's going to get better as he gets older. We can forgive everybody for being young. But one of the, the things I think that made him such a figure when he dies is that his quite genteel arguments, if you will, his quite elite arguments that he made in the 50s, at least in God and Man at Yale. I mean, the McCarthy and His Enemies was not a genteel book. Um, look almost quaint and respectable compared to the politics of the 2000 aughts, at which point his Yale education, for example, would virtually have had him read out of the party. So um, I think he, I think the movement moves rather than him. So, so the West is fascinating. You know, historians argue right and left about the West, and there's all sorts of things you can say. You can spend your whole life studying it. But, but it is worth noting that the American cowboy was enormously short-lived. But it lived, he lived during Reconstruction. The cowboy stretches from 1866 to 1886, about 1885, 1886, when a terrible snowstorm wipes out the herds and barbed wire takes care of the rest. Um, that's 20 years, and those are the 20 years of Reconstruction. So if you think about Reconstruction, and you think about what you remember about Reconstruction, you probably can't name very many African American leaders, and you probably can't mention any labor leaders, and you maybe could come up with Elizabeth Cady Stanton, um, but boy, everybody knows the American Cowboy. You know, everybody all over the world knows the American Cowboy. So why do we remember the American Cowboy from that enormously tumultuous period? And what I've argued in previous work, and obviously think is right, is that one of the central themes of Reconstruction was the argument on behalf of Southerners, Southern Democrats, that the Republicans had created a behemoth government that was aiding special interests, that was taxing Americans, because Republicans invent taxes during the Civil War, that was taxing Americans to support black people. In those very same years, the West opens up. Now, the West opens up because the American government has poured money into the West during the Civil War and after the Civil War with the railroads and, and Indian Wars and land surveys and later on damming and irrigation. They're pouring money out there. But in the telling of it, especially in the Southern newspapers and in the Plains newspapers, what you get is a region that is run solely by individuals, by these hardworking cowboys who don't want anything but to work their own way up. Now, it's an image. It's an image that people like Buffalo Bill tap into for popular entertainment. It plays hugely in the American South, but also in the American cities. But it's an image that catches on. The cowboy, the Westerner, is an individual up against a big government. And that's a theme that resonates from Jesse James, who was a criminal, let's just mention, who murdered people, but who becomes the symbol of an individual who stands against the government, which is trying to kill him, through the present. That cowboy means an individual. 
was working his way up. Now, that's ahistorical. Cowboys were not, in fact. Uh, most of them didn't manage to work their way up. Their work was terrible. I mean, I could go on and on. But as an image in American society, it's a reason that our Olympic teams almost always wear cowboy hats. That history of the West is not uniform. So it's, it's a very important image in the 1870s and in the 1880s, to some degree in the 1890s, and of course in eight, uh, the Spanish-American War, Buffalo, uh, Teddy Roosevelt's Rough Riders were named after the Rough Riders in Buffalo Bill's Wild West show. In the early 20th century, um, the Western image really fades, and during the Depression, nobody wants to be from the West. Those are the Okies, mm -hmm. you know, and the Arkies. They mm -hmm. don't want to have anything to do with that. The Western imagery really takes a downturn and then pops back up and really takes off after Brown v. Board. In the 1960s, when we get Westerns all over the American TV, and the 1970s, when, for example, Levi's go from being on thugs like James Dean in his movies to everywhere. The sales of Levi's take off in 1971. And that Western imagery really pulls, I think, from the same themes that dominated America during Reconstruction. When Nixon resigns, and he refuses to accept any responsibility for anything he'd done. And what, he, what I was referring to there was his argument that he makes in that speech that he was taken down by a liberal media. And that whole concept of a liberal media, as you know, comes out of William F. Buckley Jr.'s McCarthy and his enemies. Nixon turns it into paranoia. I think Buckley is making an intellectual argument that anybody who disagrees with him is part of a liberal cabal, which is the entire New Deal coalition. It's a formula, and the formula is education, a government that is not beholden to people at either the bottom or the top of the spectrum. And again, that's easier to do rhetorically than it is to do uh, necessarily in policy, but rhetorically it's very easy to do. Um, so it's education. It's a government that's not beholden to people at the top or the bottom of the spectrum. It's equality of opportunity. Um, and it's an emphasis on the middle class. Now, it's something not unlike uh, you have written about in the past in the Weekly Standard, your labor Republicans. The problem is that it takes an outsider like Lincoln, Teddy Roosevelt, or Eisenhower to throw off the party apparatus and say, we're going to do this the way we used to do it. Uh, if my email is any indicator, and of course the plural of anecdote is not data, uh, there's a lot of people who really would like to see the Republican Party do that. The, the idea that we should have widespread, affordable, good education, including at the higher levels. It's the Republicans who started our state universities, of course. UNC notwithstanding, people always point that out. It was before. But the rest of them uh, came from the Lincoln Republicans. Um, is central to a democracy. And, and the, the cuts we've had in education since, uh, the, since 1980 have been absolutely untrue to Republican roots.